Hi, uh, my next video is with Alana Stone. She is a director I um, met back in 2015, I think it must be now, 2014 even. And um, she was a student and I was in her school directing the end of year production and she was assigned to me as my assistant director and I kind of never looked back really because um, she was so amazing. I'd never realised what the role of an assistant director was until I worked with Alana um, and then I, we worked together several times after that on new writing um, and a couple of years ago we, uh, she AD'd for me on some uh, theatre interviews I did. So here's Alana. Um, she talks about the Canadian theatre industry and the British theatre industry, particularly in the independent, uh, smaller funded spaces, and gives us some rather insightful thoughts on what she sees coming down the tracks of both of them, how both of them exist. We go into uh, restrictions and unions and stuff. So enjoy. Uh, please click subscribe at the bottom. And uh, yeah, see you later. Hello, Alana. How are you? I'm good, Russell. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have given a bit of an introduction to you at the beginning of the video as well, so people will know our history uh, working together. Um, but could you start a little bit by telling us about uh, the kind of work that you like to be involved in or the kind of work you've done in the past or, or what type of things you've got coming up in the future that might be interesting? Sure. Um, I started off in musical theatre. I started off uh, singing classically, um, but musical theater was kind of always my love as a child. So that's what I went into. And I did my um, undergrad in that in Canada. Uh, back then it was a diploma program, now it's become a degree. And I kind of just did the whole musical theater actor scene in Toronto for a while and moved uh, slowly into directing. Uh, still primarily musicals but I slowly got introduced to new work and I've, that's basically what I do now. I work with writers and I do some dramaturgy and do R&D sessions and uh, just working with, uh, with writers to kind of help their pieces come to light. I still do musicals because I love them, but yeah, it's that kind of musical and new writing that go hand in hand now. Okay, cool. Um, and then what have you got coming up in the future? What do you want to uh, do next? What I'd like to do next, next is to actually combine those and to get more into um, working on new musicals, which I've done a little bit in the past, but usually it's either been um, more uh, old school musicals and then bits of new writing. Uh, and I'd really just love to kind of combine that because that's where um, a lot of my passion lives is in furthering the uh, the life of musical theater and how do we um, how do we adapt that how do we make that more interesting and more relevant for today are musicals still relevant and I believe they are they just kind of need to keep changing yeah absolutely yeah I love musicals I do and, uh, yeah. um, so tell us because you're from Canada um, why are you in Exotic London? Canada. <laughs> tell, tell us, how did you, uh, what made you come here? Um, what was the, yeah, what was the reason? So I'd always kind of had in the back of my brain that I'd wanted to study in the UK. And uh, this, this somehow got into my head as a child. And I remember researching Lambda when I was like 14 years old on like dial up uh, computers and old school internet. And it wasn't feasible to do my undergrad. I just didn't have the money for it. But it always kind of stayed in the back of my brain that I really wanted to, to go and do it. I think because the UK has such a long history of theater and there's a weird connection between the UK and Canada. We almost look up to the UK in terms of the talent that it produces and the theater that it, um, puts into the world so so yeah I, I kind of had that that thought and when I decided I wanted to do an MA I absolutely knew I wanted to do it in the UK over anywhere anywhere else so looked into some programs and got in and uh, there you are so do, was there also underneath all of that 
Um, did you kind of weigh up the choices? Did you think, right, Canadian musical theatre scene is harder to get into than the UK scene? Or, you know, was there any sort of motivation behind that as well? The, yeah, the motivation behind that was at the time in Toronto, I was um, an actor slash director slash producer. I had my own theater company that I was running with a few friends. I was part of the uh, indie theater Toronto scene. And I loved it. It was it was a wonderful, wonderful community. But you had to be incredibly self-sufficient. And I found myself burning out after only a few years of kind of really, really being in it. And I knew I had to continue on with this speed and this pace for the next five to 10 years if I wanted to see any sort of progression. So I decided to go a completely other route <laughs> and say, you know what, actually, I'm gonna take myself out of this. I'm gonna go somewhere else and I'm gonna go see what the scene is there. I'm going to learn, I'm gonna grow, I'm gonna make new contacts. And when I come back, I will have all of these stories to tell and people will be interested in what I have to say because I've had these adventures now. There will be this, in my head, I thought there would be this, um, this nice welcoming back to Canada saying, uh, oh, you've gone and you've done stuff in London and you've met these amazing people. You've been to the Royal Shakespeare Company. Great, come and, you know, do all of this work now with us. And that was, that was, the, that was the dream. That was the dream at the time. And uh, as it so happens, I didn't end up going back to Canada. I'm here now permanently. So, uh, so that changed. But yeah, absolutely. I definitely weighed up the options. And then there was also the logistics of it. It is easier for a Canadian to uh, work in, in the UK. So if I wanted to work after education, far easier. And also uh, price-wise, if I wanted to study in the States, it would have been way more expensive. Right. And, um, and it just, yeah, they, it would have cost me like $60,000 a year. And I'm just like, no, don't have it. Gosh, how much? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, the UK, I mean, depending on where you go in the UK, but it was a fraction of that, even with the, um, with the exchange. So I was like, that makes sense far, far more sense to do. And I'm going to sound really bad saying this. I didn't really consider anywhere in Canada because I didn't have the programs I wanted. All right. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's good because it's going to kind of lead into what we're going to talk about today because the reason I wanted to talk to you was that I would like to know your perspective from being from a different country, uh, what you felt about your training in the UK. Did it kind of marry up? to uh, what you know to your expectations um, and also I'm interested in to know the which you've kind of touched on a little bit which we'll maybe get back to later the the difference between the UK and the Canadian theatre scene um, and then what's maybe the way forward for both of them but so just to, we'll just go back a little bit so we met actually when you were a student um, mm -hmm. and you were within a uh, British school, very well respected uh, British school. Um, did did the training provide for you? Now that you're in the industry, did it provide for you? Because you did you did one year, yeah? I did. I did a one year MA program. Provide for you? Did it kind of meet your expectations? I mean, you don't have to to, to name the school. People can find that out themselves. But um, yeah, I think that's the interesting thing that's going on right now. And I think Lynn Gardner did an article about it as well, saying that. Um, the 20th century model is still being used within some theatre schools when there should be a 21st century model of work. Um, so yeah, tell me about your thoughts about that. I think, I think it did meet my expectations in, in ways I hadn't expected it to. There were, uh, of course, the expectations that I'm going to go and I'm going to become a better director and I might find some work after this. And I did become a better director, absolutely. Um, I did meet collaborators and I was able to find work afterwards. So it, it met those expectations. Uh, where it faltered, I think, was the amount of care given to students. And I think this is, uh, that happens with all 
all forms of education. And it's just because there are literally so many students. I'm not, it wasn't from a lack of trying. Um, my school had copious, copious um, methods in place to support the students. We had constant communication with our teachers. We had um, people in charge of helping with housing, with everything like that. But I felt like the actual teachers, the people we were being, that were being brought in to lead the lessons, we always felt like a one-time gig for them. And the majority of my, um, of that course was people coming in and doing a one-off lesson and a one-off lesson. So it was like a bunch of guest artists. And why was that, um, a thing for you? Why, why was that a little bit of an issue? It was an issue because I couldn't, I couldn't fail. When you've got guest artists continually being brought in who have these fantastic backgrounds and who are um, masters of their own field. I mean, it's wonderful to get to work with them, but you always have the sense that you have to impress, you have to make yourself stand out. Every, everything's an audition. Right. And education, what I've learned is that education at the basis, you need to be given the freedom to fail. And they'll tell you that. They'll say, yeah, take risks, take chances. And the minute you do and it doesn't pay off, your grades go down, they give you a talking to, everything. It, there's all these uh, negative consequences. So they tell you it's okay, but then you don't actually get the, the growth that you want to because now your mentality is that, oh, actually, no, I have to play it safe. I have to play to my strengths because if I don't, I'm not gonna get the grade I want. So you spoke about care. Yeah. What type of care did you require from the school? I think a little more nurturing, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, I'm quite a sensitive soul. And to have come over from my home to a brand new country, new school, don't know anyone, um, getting massive loads of culture shock. I felt like the school was there for me, but also not. I felt like I was on my own a lot of the time. Um, and what that did was actually made me rely on my fellow students and I found a fantastic group within the, the international group of students uh, and directors and they were amazing and creative and we had so much fun uh, but it also uh, made me look for it in other directors which is why Titus was so fantastic was because um, getting out of that kind of school scenario of just discussing plays all the time getting to put it into practice being with actors getting to work with you and our fantastic team that was like oh, right this is why I do this this is the whole reason behind it yeah it's something I'll probably just say for the viewers now is that um, when you and I met and um, we worked uh, Alana was my um, assistant director and there was always that lovely day wasn't it that everybody cites where I said uh, in front of all of the cast that whatever happens theatre must be fun yes and the gasp in the room <laughs> was palpable I mean it was just like you know, cheering and clapping wasn't it and it was mm -hmm. that was a shock to me and I didn't understand what I'd said that had that impact and then mm -hmm. Electron explained to me that that was a relief for everybody because and students who have now who are now in the late 20s have said to me since who were in that room at that time and they've said that it was the reason they joined uh, the want to work in theatre so Alana, now you've told us this, did the, your experience, was it supported well by your training? Did you feel that you, you were like, yes. oh yeah, this is, this is, this is kind of what I was ready for. Even though you said you felt lonely a little bit, disorientated sometimes. Did you come out and go, oh yeah, actually. Yeah, it was, it was surprising though, because the skills that I had learned in, um, in school, I didn't realize at the time that I was learning them that they were the ones that were actually going to service me the most getting out of school. 
uh, particularly in improvising and devising, which was something I had never touched upon before um, entering uh, school. And so that ended up being kind of my bread and butter for a while, <laughs> which I found very, very ironic. And I wouldn't have been able to do it had I not ta uh, been taught it uh, in my master's degree. So I think it, it prepared, I didn't realize at the time how well it ha it actually prepared me for right. getting out. Yeah. So, so when you graduated, you went into the, what I would, what I described the independent theater scene. Yes. Um, how was that? What is it like? Um, again, although you are most certainly British in a lot of ways, you also look inside sometimes. You have that gift of being out of it where you can look inside of it. What is the British independent theatre scene like? What do you tell your friends when we're not listening? <laughs> well, the British do this. British do this. <laughs> um, I think, oh, I think that um, there's just an abundance of it. It's the sheer volume of independent theatre. There's always something happening and, and the audiences. That, that's what amazes me is that you can have a, a showcase of a one night new piece and have the room full. That, that's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the British Indie Theatre, it's very fun. It's very generous. And uh, there's always a sense of open collaboration. I, I go and meet people who are in the, uh, the, Indian, the indie industry, and there's always a sense of come work with me. And I love that. There's always this, um, this discussion where you're talking about uh, what you like in theater and what they like in theater and finding little threads be and you just find these moments where of true connection with fellow artists. And sometimes they lead to, um, to work and sometimes they just lead to friendships or people that you just see in and around uh, different venues as you kind of work your way uh, through the different shows. But yeah, it's, it's lovely. Yeah, I always but, say that in <laughs> London, you kind of make your own theatre industry. It feels like that. You yeah. And no, no one kind of waits around as well. Um, there's no, oh, I'm just, I, I kind of have this project off the side, but I'm going to wait and see if I get this gig first. And then if, if I don't, then maybe I'll, I'll take that and I'll go put it on somewhere. Yeah, there's yeah. none of that. There's, I've got an idea. Let's get together. Let's go and do it. We don't have any money, but that's all right. We'll just go and put it on. Yeah. And I, that's amazing to me. There's no overthinking it. You, you just go out and they do it. And I think that's where the abundance comes from. There's a, a fearlessness yeah. in, the, in the indie theater. Yes. Yeah. It's also that, that kind of bug and mindset is now thankfully spreading to the rest of the UK as other scene, independent scenes grow in you know, Manchester, Bristol, Birmingham. Yeah. Which I think it's starting to be everywhere, which is lovely. And I worked with an Australian actor probably 15 years ago now, um, very famous, uh, Richard Greaves, his name was, and he was in Neighbours, uh, I think in the 90s or something, or Home and Away. And um, mm. he said to me, he said, what he loved about being here was that every town has a theatre. That's what he loves about uh, the UK. He says, he says, you don't know what it means just to walk into uh, a town in the middle of anywhere and there is a theater. He said, that, that's really strange. Whereas the British will be like, oh no, stop closing our theaters. But yeah, we, we have so many still, I think, which is something to remember. Mm -hmm. yes. but, so tell us about the independent theater in Canada. What's that like in comparison? So the, uh, the independent theater in Canada, um, it's, I think it, it kind of took off uh, when I was in Toronto, not to say that it didn't exist before, but, uh, and I, I am speaking specifically towards Toronto because that's where my, that's where I lived. That's where kind of all my contacts were. Um, we were getting new and interesting theaters. Um, Mitchell Marcus had a musical stage company. 
uh, formerly acting upstage, and that was starting to do really, really interesting musicals, and that's now taken off and become absolutely huge. We had uh, Angel Walk Theater, um, lots and lots of kind of uh, smaller venues, but uh, taking chances, and I thought that was great. And they were also really trying to push indie theater kind of forward. When I was uh, looking to start up my own theater company, there was a great handbook called literally the Independent Theater Handbook that had been brought out. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Canada. I have a copy, but it's in Canada somewhere. Um, and yeah, I, um, I think that was the name of it. But, uh, but yeah, and so I could feel like they were like, yes, let's get indie theater off the ground and moving. And, and, and so there was this big surge. And I think, I've been out of the Toronto theater for scene, scene for a while, but I think it actually really has taken off because every time I look online and at Facebook, I'm seeing all of these theater companies come up that are not the big commercial groups. So um, the theater scene in Ontario, basically, you've got the two big summer companies. You've got Sean Stratford, and then you've got Mervich. <laughs> and those are the big, um, the big ones. And then everything else is, falls into, I would say, indie or uh, more so fringe, because our Toronto fringe is massive. Yes. Not as massive as Edinburgh, but that's, I mean, you, it's fantastic, and it's a huge part of the Toronto culture. Yeah, I love buddies and bad times. Um, oh yeah, buddies! <laughs> the, um, Great, I get a show with buddies. In in New York, um, my my Brooklyn friend, she she gets so angry because in New York you do they don't have this kind of independent or fringe theatre scene um, because of what she says is that the union rules are so strict that you just cannot go into yeah. a room without paying anybody at all ever. Um, so do, is, does the Canadian theatre scene have uh, many restrictions or is it quite loose as the, in the same way in the UK? Oh no, we got restrictions. <laughs> there are very, very strict res restrictions. Uh, it is tough. I, I would say once you become equity, it is far tougher to create your own work. When you're non-union, there's a lot of... Um, Bad, not bad. There's a lot of uh, hoops to jump through because you can't get into certain doors. But the nice thing is that you can literally just get a group of friends together who want to create something and they just want a little bit of extra money. They don't particularly care about making a huge big check. This is really just about getting together and creating something and they just go and they do it. And I think, and what, but once you start getting into equity, it becomes far more difficult. The equity, from what I remember, they do have um, certain collaborations where you can do like an equity co-op where um, you've got like half equity members, half not, and you can kind of do a, a profit share that way. And obviously they waive they waive it for the fringe. So anybody who is equity can participate in the non-equity um, production in the fringe, which is fantastic. Because that way it opens it up to everyone. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So would you ever go back and make theatre then? Yeah. You would? Yeah, I would. I would. I would. I, I do. I, I, I'm, I'm starting to long for it more and more, especially now because people are posting so much stuff and um, I'm seeing artists pop up on screen that I haven't seen or heard from in ages. And I'm like, oh, look at all these fantastic things that you're doing. I miss you and I want to work with you. Um, so yeah, I, I would, absolutely. And you're about to marry a British man, aren't you? So. And I'm about to Briti marry a British man, so who knows when that'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> so just that we're coming, kind of come to the end of our little chat, but uh, knowing what you know about both countries, um, albeit in your mainstream or in your independent sectors, what do you think is coming down the track for both? Seems you have the gift of hindsight of both right now. What, what do you think is, is coming for us? Oh. 
I think, well, I think coming down the line, there's actually going to be a lot more international collaboration. What I'm seeing right now is um, because of the pandemic, because we're all in lockdown, artists are reaching out to each other across the world to be collaborators because at this point, space location doesn't matter. And I'm loving that I can watch a concert uh, about new musicals and see a composing um, duo that I know in the UK perform a song and then a composing duo from Canada in the lineup right after them. So things like that I find amazing. And I, th I think there's something in that. And I think that people will um, continue to explore those connections and those relationships and we'll, we'll, we'll start to lose the borders a bit more once the borders are lifted. <laughs> um, what I'd also like to see and what I think will come out of um, this kind of slow period, this resting period, is uh, a lot of exciting work. And I think that's going to come from the, the indie scene. I think the commercial scene, they're going to go to what they know. They'll bring in the big stars, the big names. They need to make their money back. Totally fair. But from the people who create work for Fringe, for the smaller venues, I think they're really going to um, bring out some creative, interesting, challenging works. And I think we as audiences, we need that. We're going to be starved for human connection by the time we come out of this. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, we're going to be comfortable. I think there's going to be a sense of it, once lockdown is lifted, it will actually be hard sometimes to leave our homes because there's going to be a surrounding fear. There's going to be a surrounding um, comfort in just doing as we've done. So we as theater makers need to give people a reason to get out. And that reason is to um, excite and entertain and challenge and make people feel and promise them a night of that. Yeah, that's interesting you use those two words, excite and entertain. That's kind of, although we, I think we presume that the commercial venues will go for their cash cows, which like you say is perfectly reasonable. Part of me, even my theatre making brain now is like, what's my cash cow? What cash cow can I make? Because mm -hmm. like you say, I think people will need to be teased out. So theatre may have to, in the old uh, adage, play to the cheap seats. And I think yeah. that's a good thing. I think that's a really good thing um, because it will also maybe uh, anchor us in also a, a huge part of our job, which is to entertain. Uh, Absolutely. In, in whatever way, but yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that thread that I think will come at some point is that once we get a bit of a, a signal to the end of all this, we're all going to go, right, what's going to get the bums on the seats? Absolutely. Is that going to be? And yeah, I mean, it may mean mm -hmm. that we'll have to pause some experimentation in some uh, areas of, of the work, but who knows? But I'm just thinking, about the online stuff that's happening at the moment. Uh, I sent my friend in Spain the link to the Jane Eyre that was on YouTube that the National Theatre put up. Yes. And I've been telling her for years that oh, I really wish you'd seen it, I really wish you'd seen it, and suddenly, and so she was texting me and said, oh my God, oh my God, this was amazing, it was so beautiful. And so, so part of me was like, I'm really glad that they freed that content up and then somebody mm -hmm. in Madrid, a theatre maker in Madrid, who adores the UK theatre scene, saw it finally. I mean, so that's great. And then a friend of mine yeah. online comparing at the moment for a cabaret venue. And she said she got 3,000 hits on, on the YouTube link. And she said the venue doesn't even hold 3,000. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I don't know how you monetize that. I mean, at some point it has to be monetized, right? So it has to be yeah. monetized by the venue, uh, by mm -hmm. advertising sales on YouTube, but by then you have to hit a certain mark before that happens. Uh, would you have a pay firewall with four pounds or whatever, I don't know. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think one of the hardest things that um, we as creatives were going through prior to this was getting people interested in seeing stuff. 
as much as I said, there are always audiences uh, for, for British theater. There's almost so much going on that it's hard to kind of zero, um, zero in for people. And I mean, the amount of times where you post something and a few people will like it here and there, but it just, there's so much that's going on on that feed that no one's zooming in or actually thinking about it. And now because people have the wherewithal to actually, all right, I don't have to do anything really else for this hour. I'm actually going to look at what my friends are doing and actually read them as opposed to skimming it. Yeah. And and um, saying, oh, they're doing that. You know what, maybe I do have time to go and to check that out. So I think this interest that's being created during this time, hopefully, fingers crossed, will will keep over. But I think that's that's gonna be the tricky bit. Yeah, it's going to be a story yeah. between the screen and the stage still, isn't it? It's like literally like one has to feed from the other, but they yeah. can work perfectly together, but you have to find the way each time. Mm -hmm. And just as we're coming to an end then, because you love musical theatre so much, uh, mm -hmm. is there a musical, Canadian musical, that we should know about that is new or, or do you really rate? Oh. Is there one that you go, you need to know this Canadian musical? Because I was just racking my brain then thinking. You know what? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to say a full-on Canadian. I mean, the one that you, everyone should know is Anne of Green Gables, just because it's a classic. But what I am going to say is um, I'm going to name a few composers to keep your eyes out for. Okay. Um, so Daniel Abramson was someone I went to Sheridan with. He is fantastic. He's doing loads of work right now. Kevin Wong as well is doing brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Colleen Doncy and Akiva, they had a workshop at the Other Palace with one of their shows just recently and they're doing loads of stuff. And Britta Johnson, and I can't remember if she has a collaborator but I know she's been doing some really, really great new, new works as well. So the, this is just a small pool of um, Canadian theatre composers who are all, very interestingly enough, around my age. Right. They're all in the, in the 25 to, I think, 35, 40 area. They're all in kind of like that, that, um, that middle category. And it's so exciting to see this kind of group of composers that are now really, really taking off. They're getting um, workshops in the UK, in New York, and everywhere. So um, keep an eye out for the new Canadian musical theater writers. I'm interested, definitely, be exciting. Cool. I hope I got all the names right. If I didn't, I'm zooming right. you again to edit. Um, thank you very much, Alana, for talking to us. No. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Ooh. Okay.